I'm Georgia Salanti, and I have been working in the field of evidence synthesis for about 20 years now. As patients, payers of the healthcare system or healthcare providers, we have many, many questions. People with obstructive pulmonary disease often experience breathlessness, coughing, and tiredness. Would a regular exercise program improve their general health condition and quality of life? As you know from previous lectures, we can design a study to examine this hypothesis. It can be an observational study or a randomized study where patients diagnosed with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease are randomized to a rehabilitation program with exercise or to usual care. However, we do not necessarily need to undertake such a study. In fact, many such studies do exist and have already been undertaken. The process of identifying, evaluating, and synthesizing the results of those studies is termed systematic review. McCarthy and colleagues searched the scientific literature and identified 65 relevant trials. After synthesizing their results, they concluded that pulmonary rehabilitation relieves dyspnea and fatigue. This is a systematic review published by the Cochrane Collaboration. The Cochrane Collaboration is a global non-profit organization that aims to aid in the preparation, upkeep, and promotion of systematic reviews. A considerable amount of the methodology around systematic reviews has been developed within the auspices of the Cochrane Collaboration. Let us look more carefully at the forest plot of studies that evaluate the impact of pulmonary rehabilitation and fatigue. Fatigue is measured using a part of the quality of life questionnaire and it is summarized with a mean score and its standard deviation within each study arm. For example, in the first study included by Benke, 15 people were randomized in each arm and the mean score for fatigue were 163 and minus 0.2 for the intervention and control group, respectively. This means that the intervention is associated with an average score of 1.83 higher for the usual care. Each one of the 19 studies included in this meta-analysis provides a mean difference and a measure of each precision such as the 95% confidence interval. The 19 mean differences are synthesized into a total summary effect represented by the diamond. This summary effect is calculated as a weighted average of the study-specific mean differences where the weights represent the amount of the statistical information. An easy way to think about the weights, although not 100% accurate, is that they reflect the sample size. Large studies are assigned large weights, and hence they contribute more to the estimation of the summary effect. The process of the quantitative synthesis of study-specific results in a summary effect is termed meta-analysis. Systematic reviews can be used to answer a large variety of questions. Rapid diagnostic tests for malaria are simple to use point of care tests suitable for use in rural settings by primary healthcare workers. However, it is not clear whether these rapid tests are accurate and whether they can identify which species is causing the patient's symptoms so that the appropriate treatment is delivered. This systematic review, published again by the Cochrane Collaboration, synthesized the findings of 47 diagnostic accuracy studies that compared 
rapid test to microscopy or PCR. They found that rapid tests are a viable option. They synthesized numerically the sensitivity and specificity of the test across studies and ended up with some concrete numerical results. Namely, that only 1% to 2% of patients who test positive would actually not have the disease. However, they also found that between 11% and 20% of people with malaria would actually get a negative rapid test result. Questions about treatment of a certain condition can become rather complicated, and there are many options to treat a particular condition nowadays. There are more than 20 antidepressants that can be prescribed to people diagnosed with major depression. Psychiatrists and their patients want to know whether the different drugs are all similar in their effectiveness and side effects profile, or some are better than others. We synthesized data from 522 randomized trials to show, first, that all antidepressants are better than placebo in improving symptoms. Then, using a statistical technique called network meta-analysis, we showed that some antidepressants have a more favorable efficacy acceptability profile than others. The term network meta-analysis is used because trials comparing different interventions form a network with data that is synthesized jointly in a single statistical model. Those response meta-analysis is another evidence synthesis technique that enables us to answer the question which treatment is more efficacious and at which dose. It is not uncommon to observe heterogeneity across the studies that we aim to synthesize in a meta-analysis. In a systematic review that aimed to answer the question, does exercise improve the symptoms of depression? The answers from the 35 included studies ranged from yes, it improves the symptoms considerably, to not at all. Heterogeneity in meta-analysis refers to the variability or diversity of the study-specific results. Heterogeneity can arise due to a variety of reasons, such as differences in study population, study design, interventions, outcomes, or measurement tools. To assess heterogeneity, statistical methods are used to measure it and encompass heterogeneity in the results. If heterogeneity is present, the sources of heterogeneity can be explored using subgroup analysis or meta-regression. For example, the authors of the review synthesized the studies in two subgroups, studies that have high risk of bias and studies with low risk of bias. As it is often the case, the high risk of bias studies show a stronger impact of the exercise on improving depression symptoms. Using subgroup analysis, the authors showed also that trials of short duration of exercise, less than 10 weeks, had a considerably larger average effect compared with trials with longer duration. When important unexplained heterogeneity is present in a meta-analysis, it can affect the overall summary estimate and reduce the confidence in the results. Treatment guidelines produced by most medical associations and the World Health Organization are invariably based on the results of well-conducted systematic reviews and meta-analysis. This systematic review and the meta-analysis 
found that aspirin was associated with 12% proportional reduction in serious vascular events. These have had significant clinical implications and has been incorporated into guidelines for the prevention of cardiovascular disease. Systematic reviews also have important implications for reimbursement decisions. That is the decision about a treatment or diagnostic test being covered by the national health system and the basic insurance scheme. For example, decision makers would like to know which smoking cessation strategy is most cost effective so it would be financially supported by the national health system. Thomas and colleagues synthesized data from 363 trials about the effectiveness of different strategies as measured by the quality adjusted life years, but also cost of a strategy. A network meta-analysis and cost effectiveness modeling revealed that the best value for money is provided by a drug, varenicline, in combination with nicotine replacement therapy or with another drug, bupropion. However, as with all research, it is important to interpret the findings of a meta-analysis in the context of the individual studies included and to consider the potential biases that operate within studies and across studies. A particular source of bias that operates in the context of systematic reviews and meta-analysis is publication bias. Publication bias refers to the phenomenon where research studies that show statistically significant or positive results are more likely to be published in academic journals, while studies that show non-significant or negative results are less likely to be published. Publication bias can have serious consequences for scientific research, as it can lead to an overestimation of the true association, which can result in erroneous conclusions, hinder the development of evidence-based practices, and limit the reproducibility of research findings. In 1995, Card and Kruger challenged one of the most established predictions in standard economic theory, namely that increases in the minimum wage lead to job losses and unemployment. Card and Kruger did a meta-analysis of 15 aggregated time series studies on the effect of minimum wage increases on unemployment. They concluded that the apparent association between increasing the minimum wage and increase of unemployment is because, I quote from the paper, studies in the literature have been affected by publication bias induced by editors and authors' tendencies to look for negative and statistically significant estimates of the employment effect of the minimum wage. The meta-analysis by Card and Kruger has since been highly cited and has had a significant impact on the policy debate around minimum wage increases. Reviews of studies and meta-analysis are widely used in many research fields beyond healthcare. Most notable is the work of John Hattie who collated 800 meta-analyses to identify which educational practices have the greatest impact on student learning, including teacher feedback, formative assessment, and self-reported grades. His book has a significant impact on educational policy and practice worldwide. The fifth assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change synthesizes multiple observational studies and data sets to provide a comprehensive picture of the magnitude 
and patterns of climate change over the past century. The results of synthesis of studies on sea level rise, glacier melt, and temperature increases have been instrumental for understanding the extent to which human activities have contributed to climate change and for projecting future changes under different scenarios of greenhouse gas emission. Such important and influential resources as meta-analysis need to use rigorous methods to deliver trustworthy results. Depending on the research question and the types of studies that you have, you might need to undertake a meta-analysis of randomized studies, of observational studies, diagnostic test accuracy studies, or prevalence studies. You might need to synthesize prognostic factor studies, genetic association studies, or prediction models. You might also need to apply more advanced techniques, such as multivariate meta-analysis, dose-response meta-analysis, or network meta-analysis. 